Me, me, me. Are we, are we, we're live? Oh, hey! I don't know why I never get the cue. I never, I never can. Hey, how is everybody doing? This is Jeff, and I'm here with Anthony Joyce Rivera. You're watching or going to be listening to Jeff Talks RPGs. And today we're talking about freelancing. And Anthony, first, before we start getting into freelancing, tell us a little bit about yourself, about, about you and about your TikTok career. Yeah. Well, hey, <laughs> everybody, I'm Anthony Joyce Rivera, and uh, my TikTok career is recent. Uh, what, about two months, maybe? <laughs> and so You're doing uh, good, and, though. You're getting followers. I mean, yeah, yeah you right. know, it's it's a different platform and it's a different type of content creation, right? Because it's like, you know, visual media, uh, mainly comedic stuff. And I do a crossovers between, you know, what I normally do, D&D, TTRPG stuff. And then also I'm in the military, so I have a lot of military stuff come out through that way as well. But for for uh, freelancing stuff, you know, if you all know me from Twitter, um, again, a Joyce underscore Rivera is the same on both TikTok and Twitter. So I'll make that simple. Um, I do TTRPG freelancing, mainly Dungeons and Dragons and uh, for a plethora of different companies that I've done, Wizards of the Coast, MCDM, Critical Role, um, and uh, Ghostfire Gaming and a few others out there. So I've really enjoyed it uh, coming up since 2018. Uh, to today and hoping to just chat and share some experience and some cool tips with everybody so thanks for having me on jeff appreciate it hey i i appreciate you being on I, you're gonna i think you've got some great knowledge to share with our audience and i've done some freelancing but you've done a lot more freelance than i have i've hired freelancers so it'll be interesting to hear what you have to say um and compare that to the, the processes that i go through when i hire freelance writers mm -hmm. uh, yeah. so so what would be the first thing that you want to talk about well, I guess let's like let's talk about like what is a freelancer, right? Or or what sure. makes a freelancer. So <clears throat> for those who who want to write for RPGs, TTRPGs, right? So freelancing is when a company or someone else hires you to do work for them. Now, this can be in, in a different few different ways. One can be like flat payment. So, hey, I want you to write a two hour adventure for me. I'm gonna give you a couple hundred bucks flat. Boom. Okay, that's one way. Um, number two is Hey, I want you to write a two to two hour adventure. It's going to be 5,000 words. I'm going to pay you a certain uh, amount of cents per word. And then that's going to be your pay at the end of the deal. And other ways like royalties, like, Hey, I want you to write a two hour adventure for me. We're going to sell it. I, the publisher, I'm going to keep 25% cause I'm going to handle all the editing and art and all that jazz. And you're going to get 25% of the royalties for, for all the sales. So when you think of like, how do I become a freelancer, uh, to, it's really awesome today because there's so many different venues you can use to become a freelancer. Um, what most people do though, is they start with getting experience under their belt through self-publishing. So I would say, while it's not impossible for you to come out of the cold and just out of nowhere and be like, Hey, I want to freelance and get an opportunity. Um, most, most individuals like myself will, we will self-publish something and have something of like in our portfolio, to show people and then we'll build a social media presence on like Twitter or TikTok or you know Instagram and or Discord and people will hear about you and they'll see your portfolio they'll see what you've released and they'll say hey I'm looking to hire someone would you you know be willing to work with me and you can build connections that way and start to to freelance now uh, a lot of individuals just, yeah go to ahead add, just to, to comment on that that's how I've found a lot of my the people I work with um when I did my uh, Savage Encounters line. Um, I would read some of the stuff that they had the DMs Guild, liked it, reached out to mm -hmm. them, you know, asked them if they wanted to contribute, and that worked. And a lot of those people have now, you know. So we, were, Anthony and I, were talking about this uh, earlier in Ginny too. <coughs> Excuse me, it is um, about uh, how the industry has grown since basically the dms guild came on it, it's probably started growing before then but when the dms guild hit there was you know just a a handful of people who would who would constantly put out um content i tried to do that i saw mt mt black doing it i tried to keep up with mt black i tried to outdo mt black i've never done that good luck um, <laughs> that, was, that was my goal you know i wanted to be as prolific as mt um and you know at the time tony petreca and um a handful of others and you know 
now a lot of those people have moved on in the industry. They, they picked up freelancing gigs and now they've got full-time jobs with like MCDM, Wizards of the Coast, um, mm-hmm. and other companies, you know, Cobalt Press. And it's, it's really interesting to see how that career path goes. And like you had said, we, the the basic the, the way to get started is to self publish you know and no one is going to publish or i don't want to say no one uh everyone i think has to take learning steps in this thing um the first thing you put out might not be great but you learn from that and so you keep learning and i think that's just a that's just a you know to, to be to think that you're going to be hired on by by a big company to freelance right when you've never done anything um published or or have any experience underneath your belt to actually um, write something well that they're going to be able to use and not have to edit i think it is 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 a long shot in my opinion yeah so uh, i want to talk about that topic because um I, re- I wrote a ttrpg's freelancers guide where i i talk about this very thing and so when, when we get into writing and producing material ourselves, or if you want to get into the TTRPG industry and work for Wizards of the Coast one day, right? We're, it's human nature that we want to do it now. Like, I want to do it now. I want to do it tomorrow. I want to be there. And, and I totally get that, right? I, I mean, I have that emotion the same way you do. Um, but the reality is this, like, uh, it's almost like the story of Icarus, right? When you're given these TTRPG wings and you're given your first t- uh, freelancing gig, if you're not ready, uh through experience or just kind of like pacing yourself you can get too close to the sun too fast and burn out like i have seen people uh that have been given great opportunities and they they take the opportunity and they 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 fumble the ball a little bit and then the door closes boom because in the ttrpg industry right uh it's already razor thin margins so when a writer ghosts someone or when they turn over just really bad words, it puts a lot of work on the publisher side of things where they have to now redesign things or re-edit multiple times. And it costs a lot of money, costs a lot of time. And so people talk and they'll say, hey, this freelancer uh, didn't really work out. And and so it, whether that's a fair assessment or not, that's just the way things work where people will talk about who is reliable and who is not. So I would, I would uh, urge people to think about hey this is a long game okay so for me i'll speak about my experience um i came out of the of the gate like blazing right with air of orcus and i'm doing you know fall of Eltra, all weekend at straws and i had some really good success with my self-publishing that being said i didn't get offered a ttrpg freelancing contract till two years later 2020 okay so after i think i had like eight to ten publications already out that were bestsellers So that's someone like me and i had a big social media following so i don't what i want to say is patience um even people like me who you could have a lot of good selling products and uh a big following on twitter you may not get an offer for a couple years like like i did and then just being patient and saying you know what when that door does open when the opportunity comes i'm gonna freaking crush it i'm gonna demolish it i'm gonna meet this here here's the big part i'm gonna meet the deadline to spec and that's it like um freelancing in my experience we psych ourselves out where as a writer all i have to do is ask them what do you want me to write okay i need to do it to a a suitable standard and i need to meet the deadline like Mm -hmm. they do not care about anything else i i I, if i want to make the next uh you know dragon lance novel that's great but if i don't meet the deadline guess what it counts for zero so Um, it's kind of those little things. So, you know, and, and you had mentioned people talk about their experiences with certain freelancers. And mm-hmm. I think that mm-hmm. that's because one publisher or project lead doesn't want to have someone else experience the same thing, especially when they're asked for a recommendation for freelancers. Mm-hmm. You know, we, and, you know, it's just like any other business. Um, this is a business when it gets when it comes to you freelancing, you're working for a company or an individual who is paying you to do something. And so it becomes, it, it's a business. Um, I know a lot of people are doing this as a hobby, but you really you need to start thinking about, uh, about it as also the business side and what other people are having to endure or do to pay you that money. Yeah. It's uh, uh, and you got you know the thing as a freelancer too, knowing um, to temper 
our emotions in terms of getting excited is to make sure that you protect yourself. So mm -hmm. there have been a very uh, public examples of uh, big publishers that the contracts were, they left the freelancers hanging, you know, um, because there was no contract in place or things were taken out of context. So if you're a freelancer out there, if you're going to do a freelancing thing, the other thing too is before you get all excited and just, you know, I'm going to do it. Yeah. And I'm going to start today. Um, make sure you protect yourself and say, what are the terms of this agreement? Um, you make sure that's clear. It has to be somewhere, you know, that you can tangibly refer to it, not, not like a voice call, but somewhere where it's written down. Uh, what are the expectations? What are the deadlines? What are the specifications? And um, what is the compensation? And, wh and when will that be met? So yeah. um, some people I've, I've heard stories where they get into a contract and, you know, we all got to put money on the table in our own lives. So there's a difference where if I offer you a contract and I say, hey, this money will be paid upon publication. Well, publication is an abstract concept a publisher knows. It could be a year, it could be two years, you know, it could be a week mm -hmm. after you turn it in versus, hey, you're going to get, you know, this money when you turn in final manuscript. Boom. Right. So, so yeah. make sure like as a freelancer, you kind of understand those terms when you get involved with someone is when will I be paid? Um, mm -hmm. In my experience, you know, I've always been paid after the final draft is received and, and kind of like approved in the sense of, yep, you turn in your final manuscript. I, as the you know lead designer for that project, I have reviewed it and it, and it is what we agreed on. It is yeah. 30,000 words about a, you know, space adventure or something like that. So, yeah, it's normally within... 21 to 60 days <clears throat> you do expect to get paid. Yeah. I try and pay my people as soon as they turn in their manuscript because I don't want them to wait. Um, and uh, mm -hmm. I don't know when I may get some projects. I have several projects that I've paid for writing for that I have put on the back burner because I've pursued a different project. And, you know, being a one person uh, project lead of my own company and only having so much time to, to dedicate to each project, something else pops up that's like, okay, this is more important right now, like Spelljammer, Trinkets and Treasures, that kind of something like that has to come out at a certain time in order to actually capitalize on the excitement of the market, um, of the, yeah. the game. So, yeah, yeah, really knowing when you're going to get paid is a big thing. And also the rate and the rate. That's a whole other discussion there. Um, there's a lot of discussion about rates. And I'll say that I write for 10 cents a word. I write for more than that, too. Uh, I it's money for me and I don't yeah. mind doing it. Um, <clears throat> except the contracts that you want to write for. If you don't want to write for 10 cents a word, you can ask for more or you can just pass the project. If you, you could write for less, I mean, it's money. If you, I would write for less if I needed to, you know, uh, but I don't want to step on other people's toes who say the industry needs to increase its rates because I know the profit, I know the margins on products. Um, when they're being created. I know with a, a budget, what, how much art costs, and how much layout costs, I know what the Kickstarter expenses are when you're actually trying to, to perform a successful Kickstarter. So I know the money and how that works out for me. Yeah, no, and that's, a, that's something that, you know, every individual will be different. I think uh, right. in, in my mind, when I tell, when I talk to people, I say, hey, 10 cents, I think is the mark of, that's a fair rate. Um, so if, you're, if you are out there and you are getting 10 cents offered, I think, boom, on the money, um, especially if you don't have a huge portfolio, that's, that's, that's really good. Um, you know, rates, rates vary. I, I do think that there is a trend, uh, for, for a lot of people to be making more, which is good for, mm -hmm. for those who are okay. freelancing. Um, it shows, you know, that the needle has moved because like 2016 rates were like what, two cents a word or something crazy. I yeah. think 2015 when I started or sorry, 2018, when I did my first publications, I was hearing like, like five cents where it was like the, wow, that's, that's amazing. And then, um, now we've gotten to like 10 cents is the, the, you know, the benchmark that a lot of people go off of. So it's, it's positive for, you can make a career out of this if you are serious about it and, you know, have a sustainable income on the side or to supplement your income or, you know, go full-time into freelancing. And, uh, some of the rates I've gotten, you know, uh, 25 cents a word, uh, up to my biggest rate was 35 cents a word. So the rates are getting pretty nice in some areas. Um, if you 
you know, again, I've been doing this for several years, but you'll you'll get to that point uh, if you stick with it. Now, I, I kind of want to talk about, oh, how do you do this, right? Because everybody asks like, well, okay, you're talking about freelancing, you're talking about race. How do I become a freelancer? Mm -hmm. um, there is no one way, and I've talked about, we talked about the self-publishing route, right? Um, but the biggest thing I'll, I would tell people is this, there is no like job bulletin board per se that you can easily just go to. Um, the Storytelling Collective, has something like that. They do have a big Discord community uh, and they actually have a formal education process to like write your own adventure and learn how to do that and publish it. Um, so what I would recommend for everyone is to get on social media. Uh, you don't have to be an influencer or you know a big name person and start getting involved in these TTRPG circles, right? You're gonna start to see who's who in the zoo, um, who is talking about TTRPG stuff, and what you may find is that a lot of individuals are very open to sharing uh, ways for you to get an assignment, um, tips on how to do that. And also if they see your work or they get to know you and, and you know see you talking about TTRPG stuff with them or in the, in the community, when opportunities come up, they might remember you. So I'll be very transparent here. I get asked a lot of times, hey, uh, Anthony, who, do you have a list of people you would recommend for an adventure or for mechanics? And the answer to that is yes. Um, I keep a list. I, I, it can be people that I have never spoken to, simply that I observe on social media and I have looked at their material. Okay. Um, and this, this go, what's go, what is true for me is like multiplied by this is how a lot of this stuff happens. Okay. Mm -hmm. So uh, there are people watching you. Uh, and there are people watching how you interact on social media. And I'll I'll kind of give a, I don't want to say a word of caution, but just a realist perspective here. Uh, people look at how you are on social media. And if you're positive and contributing to the industry, the community, they'll take note and they may investigate you further to see what kind of work you're doing. Um, if they see you as always being negative and burning down everyone around you uh, and being negative, that will be something that is a red flag where people may be cautious to approach you um, or or to recommend you to others. And that and that is just like a real a real thing. And I've seen actually this where um, there are major companies that have lists of people um, who they don't work with based off of just social media stuff. And when I've worked for some big publishers, I had to get vetted uh, on my own social media. So these things are like this is. I'm not making a moral judgment on whether that's good or bad. Right, I'm simply right. stating it as a matter of fact, right? Because this is stuff that I, that I have to even worry about um, on social media with my own followings is how, if I say something, how does it come across and, and what will the impact be um, uh, for, for big publishers when they do that type of social media vetting, which is not done by, you know, designers that's done by like corporate people. Uh, and then how does that affect your, chance to to get an assignment so something that um i had not known about uh until i experienced it myself and i'm like oh damn this is real and so i'm just sharing that here so other people know that again no moral judgment on whether that's a good or bad thing simply a matter of fact that that happens so not yeah and, it, and it's not directing people to do that either i mean if you want to be open about mm -hmm. things that you disagree with or this and that go for it but just realize that you are representing yourself and your your what you bring to an rpg company and they may not agree with with that they may not want to um fear the backlash that may come from something that mm -hmm. goes awry you know mm -hmm. uh, but it, it's, it's entirely up to you it's your decision on how you want to portray yourself on social media and yeah um i have gone the quiet route i don't speak out about things i just i know my i'm a business and i'm building my business that way and trying to represent myself as a business and yeah and, and let me add some clarity to uh where i'm getting at it's it's with things like you know um if you work for a publisher and the contract is honored from both ends and then you know you you light a fire under them for for something right. you know that wasn't really true or something like that where you were you know ah, i worked for this company i got paid but they suck and they're the worst you know and if if it's not really true or if it's like a personal grudge um that kind of like thing can hurt you so i 
you know, I'm open on uh, my own social media is about, you know, things that happen in our world. And, and I, I, so I, I still am open on my own personal opinions on things like that. And it hasn't negatively affected me. But if I were to talk about a company I worked for and, and kind of not present the whole truth or, you know, just if I had an ax to grind, that's the kind of stuff where I think it would be um, right. causing. And that's what, I, that's what I meant also. Yeah. For the most part. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, you know, I mentioned how, how do people get in, into the freelance industry also? I think another piece of that is networking. I mean, there are, there are people who have worked on collaborations uh, mm -hmm. on the DM field that uh, have probably been recommended from by the project leader, or somebody else of that collaboration to work on another project. So, you know, really working with others, um, building that network of, of individuals who know your name and know your work is a great way to uh, possibly get a freelance gig as well. Yeah, it's um, you know, and I, I see Alan's in the the uh, Twitch chat here. So Alan Tucker, hey, how you doing, Alan? Uh, he's a great guy. Yeah, I'm I'm, I'm actually working on a project uh, for him. I'm excited about, but he has the uh, Indie Games Cooperative. So there, which is like a mentorship group. TTRPG is looking for a lot of POC creators. You know, LGBTQ, very diverse, uh, uplifting, marginalized creators. And so there are these uh, cooperatives, these groups that are coming out where uh, they are communities and they are offering resources and experience and mentorship to help uh, creators thrive, flourish, learn uh, kind of the same tips we're talking about from experienced individuals and then taking that information and moving into the space to create their own products and become freelancers themselves. So um, again, that is the Indie Games Cooperative. Alan Tucker runs it. So if you're, you know, on, on Twitter, find him and look that up but there are several like the dms discord lounge is one uh where that's for the dms guild discord it's an unofficial uh discord server but that's what kind of where i found my first community uh and there's a lot of people there so you can get into these uh, little communities and i'm sure they have some for itch.io and drive through rpg has a discord and a lot of these discords are popping up where get into those hubs and and start kind of networking like you said and building those connections and you will it's like it's like playing D, &D right you're gonna start off at level one like right. you're gonna you're gonna suck you're gonna have like five hit points and and so but it, the more products you do you'll level up uh the better your reputation is for meeting deadlines and producing quality work you'll level up and eventually you might be slaying dragons or like my best buddy you know justice who ended up at wizard of the coast from like dm's guild so i've seen it mm -hmm. from like I'm, you know, collaborating on DMs Guild, freelancing, you know, working full time in industry at like Beetle and Grimm's and then boom, Wizards of the Coast. So the pipeline is there. Celeste Conowich is another one. I worked with her. Uh, she, you know, is now at Cobalt Press. So um, there's so many people on DMs Guild who like started out that were just like, hey, I do this other random thing in my real job and I'm going to make a D&D thing and they make it on DMs Guild. They start liking it. They start the next step, usually freelancing a lot. They freelance a lot, and then boom, they end up at a at a company. James Intracasso, mm -hmm. uh, yep. you know James Hake, Hannah Rose, all all these, you know uh, Sadie Lowry's doing stuff for Wizards and and Laura, all, all a bunch of people. Um, so that is to say, like there, this is not. If you're someone out there who is just interested in this, like there there is no timeline on when to start i started i think i was as in my, i'm 36 right now so i was in my 30s right um you could be younger than me you could be older than me and get started and be successful so like go do I it i was older than you when i started so no way no way yeah i was yeah i'm a little bit older than you anthony um, oh, i got a lot of grades you know so yeah 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 uh, so uh, let's talk about this now what about keeping your intellectual property that you write for others because I know oh, there, are some people, yeah. there are some people who there are some companies who say, OK, you can keep your IP, meaning that you can go back and use that again in another product if you want to. And others are like, no, I own that. And one of the things I think about is when you're working on the DMs Guild, you basically have to own the IP if you're the project manager, because you don't want that person to go out and use that same IP for like Cobalt Press or or some other company, because then you've broken the license of the DMs Guild. Yeah, well, I would say the DMs Guild license is, you know, if, if you're collaborating with someone, uh, obviously they would need to know where it's being published. So mm -hmm. let's say you're collaborating with someone and 
you say, hey, this is going on DMs Guild, you would want, you would, you as a creator would want to know what that means. So the DMs Guild is very unique because when you put it there, it becomes locked into that stove pipe. Uh, it can never leave that platform. It's owned by DMs Guild. Not owned, it's not owned by them. It's not the right word. It's locked into that agreement. So right. it's exclusive to be sold there. Um, you know, I know like with your stuff, Jeff, so if I wrote, which I have written for like your your villains layers and stuff like that, that IP, you've told me like, hey, this is work for hire. This is going to be, you know, my your publishing company will own it. And I as a creator understand that. But I understand it from the get-go. So right. when you are a freelancer and you're starting out, like this is very true. Work, work for hire is when a company will hire you, they'll give you the pay, you know whatever compensation you've agreed on and that's it like you wipe hands and you go separate ways and your work is literally theirs so the best way to think of it is like the the, the movie directors that are making star wars movies like they don't own star wars they're they directed a star wars movie and and they wrote a script or something and that's it right they don't own star wars nor do they own the characters that they put in those movies they maybe created them and they're the creators of that story but they don't own the intellectual property. So um, there has been one instance where I worked for uh, Bob World Builder. Uh, he's you know on YouTube, and I made a creature that I thought was really cool uh, for one of his Patreon adventures. And I I really liked this creature, and I said, hey, um, if you're not planning on doing anything, like I'll take a lower rate uh, if you let me keep the intellectual property of this creature. And he's like, uh, you know, we worked out. He, we made some minor tweaks where. Uh, the creature I made like I don't know a young version of that creature for his adventure But he was willing to work with me like if he had if, if he had wanted he said like hey, you know Instead of this amount of cents per word uh, for that stat block I'll give you this and then you could keep the IP like that was an agreement He was open to and both I was open to mm -hmm. um, so that is possible where I could walk away from that Having gotten compensated for the work Maybe a little bit less and that then I originally agreed upon because I had countered with Hey, if I get a little bit less pay, I in return keep the it, the IP for that creature, which is valuable to me, um, because I did take that creature and I put it in another project product that I got paid uh, thirty five cents a word for. So uh -huh. boom, double pay. Um, yeah. But but I gave the IP away at that point to to them. So um, but the point is like you can you can do this and uh, what's useful about that right is not to hey I'm double dipping everywhere. It's like Hey, maybe I have a little compendium of creatures I've created now. Like maybe I got 15 or 20. And if I own the IP for that, maybe I make my own Kickstarter, you know, mm -hmm. and I a book of creatures. Or when someone's like, hey, I need a creature for this book. Do you have any? You can go through there and say, yep, here you go. And you can just, you know, um, use one of those. So that and also um, I want to share like a, a, a small caveat story to think about, though, as a creator. What is your goal? Because it's not all about money all the time money's nice don't get me wrong we, we love money we need money to live and to get nice things but um I, I spoke to like ed greenwood right about the forgotten realms and i think ed greenwood you, you know lovely man uh he got paid i think a couple thousand bucks for wizards of the Co or no tsr back then tsr bought his ip forgotten realms they for a couple thousand dollars right now people might say man he got screwed or whatnot but that's not what I'm, the point I'm trying to make. The point I'm trying to make is he says more people know about the Forgotten Realms because that publishing company took his IP and made it a worldwide empire of Dungeons and Dragons played around the world. Like mm -hmm. Ed Greenwood himself, he has other things that are his own IP, but I guarantee you most people even watching this or hearing me talk about it can't even think of what one of those IPs are. And that's the point is like, do you want your thing to be shared far and wide around the world? further than you can ever get it yourself. Um, because if you think about it that way, maybe your artistic creations are worth giving up to a bigger you know, publisher so that the idea can percolate and permeate throughout society or culture or whatnot. Um, you could also take and keep the IP yourself and try to do that. It's just a lot harder uh, and, a, and a lot of people don't succeed. So it depends on what your angle is. If, if your angle is that you want people to hear a story and see your stuff, like freelancing, that's kind of why I like it, where I know a lot of people in a different audience will see the works I create in that realm versus like my DMs Guild self-publication stuff.
yeah no that's a, that's a great story and a, and a great um way to think about what you want to do with with this you know um and there's a lot of different there's a lot of people who, who have different uh plans for th for their writing you know they're just doing it for fun they're doing it for a hobby they're doing it for a little extra cash mm -hmm. some people are doing it for a, a second job that's why I, i'm doing it i'm doing it to build a a small empire for my daughter too hopefully one of these days she'll be able to take over and do something with um i'm doing it so i can retire sooner uh i don't want to sit in the desk and i'd rather be sitting back here and writing and, and leading projects and doing freelance writing and and I enjoy writing so that's, mm -hmm. that's why i'm trying to pursue this further um but yeah everybody's got their own reason for doing this and you know one of the things that that makes it difficult sometimes especially when you get into freelance work is the imposter syndrome um that's really rough at times and that that is when you i don't have the definition pulled up right now but that's when you start doubting yourself doubting your place in the industry doubting that you're as good as other people think you are and that is pretty um i think typical in the industry uh, i know i go through it quite often um i've seen other people mention it as well uh, but the the biggest thing there to think about is that other people like your work they buy your work and if they continue to buy your work and buy your other projects then they like you mm -hmm. and that that is a reason to um or that that's to help you skip over that imposter syndrome to make yourself uh -huh. feel better, you know. Uh -huh. And one of the best things to do when you start feeling that way is talk to somebody else, you know. Uh -huh. Get get a hold of another creator and say, hey, I'm just I'm I'm just not feeling right, you know. Or you know, reach out and discuss. And speaking with other creators, like this this discussion here, this is great. This makes me feel good, um, knowing that we have watchers and listeners. And later on, uh -huh. it makes me feel good to know that people are listening to us talk and and listening to what we've learned and our thoughts. And they may not agree with them, and that's fine, uh -huh. because you know we are a, a world, and people have their own opinions and everything. So that's I don't people don't have to agree with everything I have to, I have to say, yeah. but I don't agree with people. Um, but yeah, getting over that imposter syndrome, realize that other people have it too. And you're not the only one who goes through that. Yeah. So imposter syndrome is interesting because it, it is very hurtful to the overall goal of like your career as a freelancer or a creator. And and the, the reality is this, look, no one's going to offer you a contract if, if you suck. <laughs> I mean, right. Bottom right. line. So even right. getting offered a contract is like proof is in the pudding. You get what I'm saying? Like you're offered the contract, you're you're good, um, right. or you've been vetted, or, or in most cases. And then also, like you said, you you publish something and it sells. Now I will. I here's something that's very interesting that I just got to get off my chest. The best, my favorite things that I have made that I'm like the most proud of have sold the least amount of stuff. Okay, like you know, yeah. you know what I mean? Like like the stuff I'm like, this is the best. This is my magnum opus, and it sells like you know, crap. Um, so that happens to me and I have, again, I have a big audience. I have a proven catalog of stuff and I can put a ton of production into the, the things that sell bad. They have like custom art, they're beautiful and they just fall flat. And like, that's just like life, right? Like some things that's just one of the worst flat. feelings. Yeah. It's when like, you think it's the greatest <laughs> thing ever. You put it out there on the guild or somewhere and it doesn't yeah. sell. You're yeah. Like, yeah. 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 Yeah, what did I do, or why? Why is this selling? You know, and, you know. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, so, so, I hope that helps, like people, to help get over the imposter syndrome. Is look, um, as creators and as human, as just as human beings, we cannot create um, magnificent work, consistent all the time, but we can consistently create good work. You see the mm -hmm. difference there, like. Like Michelangelo in the Sistine Chapel, right? Uh, there's only one Sistine Chapel that I'm aware of. If you told him to do that like all the time, every time for the rest of his life, to do it would burn out and he probably would die early. He probably did die early. Who knows? But <laughs> my point is like we have to give ourselves slack. And this is where imposter syndrome is very dangerous, where if you keep in the race, if, you, if you're comparing yourself to others and you start to – you mentioned before it's like trying to keep with empty black i can only imagine like maybe the burnout that resulted in that because <laughs> you're 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 trying to out produce someone else um and the pool of freelancing the industry is is so big it's so big that no one 
individual, no 10, no 100 individuals suck up all the air in the room. There's always room for other creators. So uh, you can also get into a trap of taking on too much work. So I've seen this where people want to stay relevant. They're like, oh, if I don't have a adventure coming out every month, I'm not relevant. People will forget me. And that is a real feeling. It's a real emotion. I felt it. I have seen others that I felt it. So um, I'm not invalidating that. I'm saying that that is true. But when you feel that, here's where I will caution. The red flag must go up because um, if you overload yourself like that, you will you will burn out because alas, you're just a human being like we all are. Um, and and then things will crumble. You'll drop a deadline and then, oh, crap, you know, this project fell, this project fell. And then things are going haywire. Life is stressful as it is. Now you have all that stress on top and you're going to perform. It's like a, you know, right. self-fulfilling prophecy of, of failure. Um, and I have that seen some, some very talented folks, you know, burn out that way. And, and, and it's happened a lot, uh, to different people. And so just word of caution, don't let the self imposter syndrome really make you an imposter. Cause, cause right. the self imposter syndrome is something you feel when you're really not, you're not an imposter, but the burnout and the failure that can trap you from that, it, it can make you you know, really see failure and be like, ah, oh, crap. So, right. And I'll just, uh, okay. I have a current Kickstarter running horror devil's run. Okay. And it's at almost 400% funded at roughly $3,000. Okay. I had a, I had a low goal of 750 and that didn't mm -hmm. cover expenses, mm -hmm. but I wanted to, I was going to get it out there anyway. I figured if I get it $750 for it, I'll be good. Um, in the back of my head, I wanted to hit 40,000. You know, 40,000 mm -hmm. because I've got all those different tiers. I've got my digital tier that get all my PDFs, you know, but it's not going to hit that. It's not on track to hit 40,000 because, you know, 40,000 would be great. I could do this and this and this. I could pay off this and do that and that. Um, so, you know, that's a little, I mean, I'm, I'm happy that it's where it is right now, but mm -hmm. I know it's not going to hit that high end goal that I had. And so, mm -hmm. you know, that's, that kind of makes you feel a little bit down too um, when things don't. Like, like our adventures that we wrote or, or the things that, mm -hmm. that you've written who we thought were great. And, you know, we had the high expectations for them um, that they just didn't pan out, you know? Mm -hmm. And then also when you start trying to put out an adventure a month, unless you have a really good idea for it or the drive to do that, you may not be writing your best writing. You know, it may take you, you may have this great idea. But then if you were to think about it, maybe a few weeks longer, it, you might build on that idea even more and make it even better. You know, if you're just putting out adventure after adventure after adventure, it's just it may not be as good as it could be if you were to take a little time to do it and have fun with it rather than, you know, just pushing through it. Mm -hmm. Now, again, it, it depends on what your um, what your goal is. You know, if you're just if you have all these little adventures that you've done for your home game and are converting those into D&D. DM skill stuff. That's a little easier. That's where I actually started with my stuff. Is most of the adventures I published were for my home game, um, and then I started coming up with new ideas that I hadn't run, and so then I had to play test those after I built them and that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, it, it, it like you had said, it, it, it's hard to get. It's easy to get burned out, especially mm -hmm. when you try to push out so much content. Mm -hmm. But I just want to take a real quick break and say, if you're watching the show or listening to the show. Go to twitch.tv uh, slash Jenny Loveday and click on that little subscribe button in the bottom right hand corner of your screen so that we can get some more subscribers to Jenny channel, Jenny's channel. Jenny sits in the background and um, takes care of all the technical stuff for me. And since last episode, I'm not allowed to watch the tri Twitch stream anymore and, and watch for questions. Um, I was too distracted. I can't do <laughs> I can't do more than one or two things at once. And so Jenny sits back there also and sends me little questions um, that the audience may have. And with that, does the audience have any questions? Uh, if you do, let us know and Jenny will let us know and um, uh, and we'll, we'll try to answer them for you. But let's go back to, um, so we've talked about IP, we've talked about freelancing, uh, contracts, deadlines. Um, what else can you think of that you might wanna share with the audience? Hmm. Um, I think, um, you know, having fun and I, I, I want to also emphasize when you take a freelancing assignment, um, make sure you set up yourself for success. Uh, so I talk to 
um, some very, you know, wise individuals in the industry of what to expect in terms of like writing word rates. Okay. So a full time professional game designer can put out, is expected to put out a thousand words a day. Right. But when you get a contract, like I've seen so many people kind of not understand uh, how hard it is to write a thousand words a day or what the expectations are because they may get an assignment that's like, hey, we need you to write, and I'm not kidding, I've seen this, uh, 10,000 words in like 10 days. <laughs> like, what? And like, if you set, if you accept that, you can, you're going to set yourself up and a lot of times for failure. Um, unless you're just like in a really in the zone Zen moment, you have nothing going on in your life, right? Um, so when you sit down and you, you want to think about like, I'm going to freelance kind of see what your daily word count can be. Is it a thousand words a day? Is it 500 words a day? But if you know that up front, when you're offered a contract, you will be able to negotiate the deadline. So I've had times where they give me a deadline. I say, look, um, I really want to do this project, but based on all the things I have going on, I need an extra week or two. Can we do that? And they'll say, yeah, what we'll do is we'll, we'll put yours at the back of the queue for editing. Cause there's a process these things go through. So, if you talk to the leads and you're open with them up front, knowing what your word rates are going to be, um, you know, go with that. An easy benchmark for like, if you're someone that like doesn't know what your word rate's going to be, you haven't written much, you never calculated it, you never thought about it. Uh, the 500 words a week is what um, I've been told major corporations that do TTRPG writing uh, expect from a freelance writer. Okay. 500 now, words a week? 500 words a week. They said, if you're, if we're going to hire a freelancer, um, if we're going to, if we want them to, they said through experience, it's 500 words a week. That's what they expect, uh, the output. And, and I was kind of blown away. I was like, wow, that's, that's not a lot of words. But when I think of it, right, if you're given like a 5,000 word assignment, you know, that's going to put you what, 10 weeks, give or take for some of these big talking about a hardcover book, you that is a timeline that's given sure. now not every company is going to do that they're going to do a smaller timeline right maybe because they have less budget so they've got to squash the production cycle but i'm only saying that because if that is what uh people that have been in the industry for 30 years have seen over time what is a consistent word rate for a freelancer in, in general like really not taking into account the individual but just freelancers in general that's kind of where you should start if you've never really done any freelancing yourself is think of 500 words a week and then maybe do some self-publishing and then calculate that and see if that's what it is or if it's more if it's more great but i'm just kind of trying to give a, a starting point because when you do get these assignments you're going to have to look at your calendar and i've i've turned down um don't be afraid to turn down assignments that's another thing um exception of you know if you literally need the money to pay your bills okay if you don't if you're in a position where this is a more of a side income stream, pace yourself and um, don't be afraid to say no. I've said no to amazing opportunities that I wish I didn't have to say no to. I said no because I knew um, it is not beneficial to myself or the publisher to say yes and then fail. That right. That is much worse. And those same people that have asked me uh, end up coming back anyway and asking me you know, months later on another project and then right. I have time and I say yes. And then now I succeed, they succeed. And there's something comforting about uh, a, a project lead. And like Jeff, correct me if I'm wrong, but if you saw someone and you thought they were talented and you wanted to work with them and they said, look, I want to work with you, but uh, I've calculated my schedule and I can't do this project, uh, but you know, let's do the next one. I think there's something comforting for the project lead to know like, okay, this person is serious. And when they say yes, they mean yes. Yes. Vers versus exactly. like, you know, they're going to say yes. And then I'm, I'm going to get ghosted at the end and, and be out <laughs> of a writer or something. So, right. Yeah. Yep. No, definitely. Yeah. Communication is big. Um, like you said, uh, can you can, can communicate that with them to explain why you can't take on the project? Uh, if you have a delay, communicate with your uh, project lead. Um, if you need extra time, communicate with your project lead. Don't just leave them hanging. Let them know and let them know ahead of time. You know, give them a few days 
or a week or so, you know, before deadline and say, Hey, I've just had some things come up. I need some more time. And they're usually work with you. It's, 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 um, a lot of, a lot of things aren't hard, hard deadlines. I mean, you want to hit your deadlines, but people know, people understand that things come up. You know, a lot of people in this industry are hobby writers. You know, we are not full-time, um, this is all we do. You know, we have day jobs and families and everything else. And, uh, you know, trying to get the writing time in is difficult sometimes. So communication is definitely big, big key. Um, when you're, when you're a freelancer as well, you know, and, and another thing I want to point out with freelancers is if you are solely re relying on your freelance income, um, I think you need to consider putting some things out on DM skill, drive through RBG, finding, you know, no, getting a revenue stream behind you also. So you're not just re, um, relying on your on your freelance money because you want to, you know, have something coming in also. You know, it's nice to see money generating on your other products. And, uh, you know, Kickstarters are great, but also understand that there's a lot of money that goes into a Kickstarter. Uh, if you get $20,000 for a 156-page Kickstarter, you're probably going to spend $20,000 or more to produce that book. Um, Unless, you know, you've got some kind of royalty agreement with the artists and everything like that to where you're going to split out a certain percentage of the of what you earn first for the Kickstarter. Uh, so you know, the money is not easy to come by, but it's out there and um, don't make it your goal. I wouldn't I don't I would say not to make it your goal to write for Wizards of the Coast. And here's why, because they plan their books out. You know, several years in advance. You're ruining my goal, Jeff. <laughs> oh. Well, you can still make it your goal, Anthony. I'm not saying don't necessarily, you know, but I mean, make it your goal to be a good writer, um, to show people what you can do, to, you know, um, fulfill contracts and, and, and uh, freelance gigs the, the right way. You know, make it your goal to be a good person. In, in the industry and uh, show people what you can do. And then maybe you'll attain the Wizards of the Coast, the Cobalt Press, the MCDM, you know, the Ghostfire Gaming, uh, so, uh, you know, a lot of the other bigger companies that are actually hiring freelancers. Mm -hmm. um, because, and honestly, the freelance pool is huge right now. It, it wasn't like this in 2016. It wasn't like this probably before 2016. Um, and so companies have a lot of people to choose from. And that's why I don't want to say don't get don't get down if you're not asked to write for a big company, um, because there are a lot of people to choose from in the industry. So, yeah. And, and let me let me add just one thing to that, because there, there is a lot of people in the industry. But I've recently um, did a survey where I talked to a lot of people um, and I hear, you know, I'm not name dropping names. I'm just trying to give some context. Um, Sean Knitter at Evil Hat Games. Um, I've talked to Chris Perkins at Watsi. I've talked to James and Chicasso, Hannah Rose, all these different folks, MCDM, uh, some folks at Critical Role. From a perspective of like, hey, if I'm giving advice to freelancers, like what would you, what do you see that is lacking from freelancers? Okay. So I asked them that question bluntly. Um, and here's what they said. They said that the freelancing pool is is very big, uh, like you just said, but they said the pool of reliable freelancers is extremely small. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I said, what do you mean by this? Like, what do you, and it, these are, these were different again, people that know what they're talking about, but it, individually. So this wasn't like in a group setting. So they're not copying each other's answers, but they all said that. Uh, and then they said, we're not looking again for people. Pe when we give people a project, we just want them to hit the deadline and write good enough words where it doesn't require a ton of editing. Mm -hmm. And if the structure of the adventure is sound, and it meets what we wanted. Like that's all we're looking for. They said they're having problems finding that. Um, mm. This is very good news for if you're out there and you're listening to this. Like hitting a deadline. I can't stress enough. Hitting a deadline is like the biggest gate to success, uh, and that is coming all the way from Wizards of the Coast down. Boom! If you can consistently hit a deadline with good words, and what I mean is good is your project lead is not going to have to rewrite it themselves or have you know a developmental editor redo the whole thing. Grammatical edits are fine, okay? That's expected. Editing is expected in your work. But if it's structurally good and sound, that's all they want. So don't psych yourself out. When you're given an assignment, do not psych yourself out about trying to, to write the next amazing thing that's never been seen on planet Earth. No, just do what they want. Be simple, 
and, and, and good and meet the deadline. And I yeah. guarantee you, you will get known and people will notice and you might end up, you know, writing for wizards or something else right. down the road because they've all said the same thing to me in isolation. And I was kind of blown away. Wow. That's a big, that's a big deal. And more, more freelancers need to know that because mm -hmm. it's, it's, they are chomping at the bit for the reliable freelancer. That's really great to know. Yeah. It's really good information. Well, we are about out of time. Um, let's go ahead and Anthony, can you tell people where you can find where they, where they can find you again? Yeah. So you can find me on Twitter and on TikTok. I am a Joyce underscore Rivera. I also have a website, anthonydreams.com, where you can find all of my uh, products that I've published and see what you want to get if you like them there. And uh, yeah, so thanks for having and me on. If you're on TikTok, I suggest you go out or recommend that you go out and check out Anthony's TikToks because they are <laughs> very informational and humorous sometimes. Um, uh, the mafia bits are great. Um, yeah, there's some, there's, there's some good stuff on there. And Anthony, I want to thank you again for being on the show. I think you've given us a lot of great knowledge. And it's been a great just discussing um, these things, especially the last bit where reliability and deadlines, and, you know, uh, that I think that's really something that people need to hear. Mm -hmm. And um, so, again, thank you. I am Jeff Stevens. You can find me on Twitter. Uh, you can find my Kickstarter. Uh, well, on Twitter, I'm at J Corbin Stevens, and my Kickstarter currently is Horror Devil's Run. Um, I'm on the DMs Guild, and I'm not very active on Twitter, but I do promote my stuff and retweet people. Um, I just, you know, I have a quiet voice. Uh, but anyway, thank you to Jenny Loveday in the background here for producing, watching, and taking care of everything else in the background. And thank you to the uh, watchers and listeners. We appreciate you. Uh, Anthony, I did donate $20 to your charity, which was? Game to Grow. Well, Give, give to grow. Yep. Yeah. And um, yeah, we, I typically donate $20 to every guest's uh, charity of choice. And so thank you for that. And mm -hmm. everyone else, uh, thank you for being on the sh for watching the show, listening to the show. We appreciate you. And we are out. <laughs>